expressed in our song some wonderful testimony <laughs> and have <coughs> recited in some of the realities of who God is that he'll make a way when there seems to be no way. And, 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 I, and I love that the reality that though Satan should buffet and trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ
has enough sense to screw the lid back on the peanut butter jar, it, it is going to leave the house and go out on his or her own. Eventually, that day is going to come to view. That day when you retire and you don't know if you're going to have enough money to be able to pay the bills, eventually that worry, that concern is going to come into view. That issue that has been just uh, sitting out there in, in Never Never Land, but it's just hanging there between you and that family member that lasted from the time that you were children, eventually going to have to come, going to have to be addressed. You can write in whatever you want this occurrence to be, but eventually that thing that you're worried about is going to come into view. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and saw his biggest worry he saw was coming, and with him were 400 men. And I'm going to tell you what Jacob did. He panicked. He did what you and I would do. Now, he was prepared. He had already split the people up, made two companies of them. He already knew how they were going to look. He had already given them instructions. He had already figured how he was going to react. He had already sent ahead of him offerings of peace. He had already prepared to be the one over. He, he, he was ready to bow down seven times. The number of completeness in the Bible is the number seven. I'm not sure if that really plays into this, but it's there. And he bowed down to him seven times as he's going. He takes a few steps. This is how I imagine it looked. He took a few steps and he bowed down. And he'd stand up and take a few steps and he'd bow down. And he'd stand up and take a few steps and he'd bow down. Seven times he would bow down before he got to his brother and the 400 men that were there. His wives were behind him. His children were behind him. The two groups of people were behind him except those that he had sent ahead to be able to be the offerings of peace. And he crossed over and bowed himself and came near to his brother. When that thing that you are so worried about eventually is seen, go ahead and cross over to it. Go ahead. Go ahead and meet that thing. When that secret that you have been holding for so long that nobody on earth except you and maybe one other person ever, ever even knew about finally comes to light, go ahead and cross over and face it. Don't let fear stop you from finding the resolve that you need to whatever the circumstance is in your life. Cross on over. You might find out that that big wedge that's been between husband and wife since about the third year you were married and you started having children really isn't such a big wedge at all. You might find out that the boss who's been looking at you and who's been talking to others about you, behind you, when you're called into the office, is not calling you in to fire you, but to give you a promotion and a raise. You don't know until you go and you face it. It may be he's calling you in to fire you. At least it'll be resolved, right? It may be that the problem between you and your husband or wife is bigger than you ever imagined it to be, but it's time to face it. It's time to get up. It's time to bow down in reverence to the reality that it exists and then stand up and make your way to it so that you can face whatever that issue is that's drawing your attention from keeping you from moving on in life. And that's exactly what Jacob did. He did so with a plan. He did so with, with integrity, with honor. He did so with ex, expeditious speed. He just got up and went, did what he needed to do. But he did that. And when Esau saw him, he drew his sword. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. When Esau saw him, he pulled out his pistol and... No, no, no. That, wait, wait, let's look at that again. Verse 4. Are you with me? When Esau saw him, Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And he lifted up his eyes and Esau did and saw the women and the children. Who are these with you? And he said, these are the children God has graciously given your, uh, given, 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 given these, uh, who are these with you? God has graciously given your servant. These are the ones God gave me. Listen, once you get there, 
receive the embrace. What you see, what's on the horizon, that thing that you're so worried about, that thing that you're so troubled over, get up and receive the embrace. And sometimes, today's a message of good news, it's an embrace. Sometimes it's a sword. Sometimes it's an ugly thing. Sometimes it's a cancer that will not be defeated. Sometimes it's a breakup that cannot be avoided. Sometimes it's, a, it's an economic situation that just simply cannot be bought out of. But sometimes, sometimes it's an embrace. Would you receive the embrace even, catch this, if the last meeting was ugly? 20 years ago, Jacob had been less than honorable toward his brother for the last time that Esau, his brother, could accept that from him. His anger was riled to, to the heights. And the embers were burning strong and the flames were just all over. And, and, and he was breathing death threats against his younger twin brother, Jacob. He stole his birthright. He stole his blessing. And, and, and I'm just tired of mom picking him over me. Can't take it anymore. And our dad's about dead. And as soon as our dad's dead, so is this little brother of mine, and it's going to be just going to be the end of it. See, the last meeting between Jacob and Esau some 20 years ago, that's important, was ugly. Their mom had to get involved and send him away to Uncle Laban's house so that he would be safe for a few days that turned into 20 years. And the possibility was that Esau was going to kill him on sight. But he got up. He went. And what did he saw have for him? He had an embrace. Brother, let's let the past be the past. There's a lesson for us right there, isn't it? The last time I saw that person, they said, they did, they were. And I don't want to be anything near around that person anymore. I don't want to have anything to do with that. I'm just not going to have any. You, you know what I'm saying. Some of you have said those same things. And if I were willing to be very honest with you today, I would say so have I. I just don't have any use to be around that individual anymore. But 20 years later, instead of a knife in the back, there comes a hug around the neck. Instead of a punch in the face, there's a kiss on the cheek. Instead of tears of pain, there's tears of, of happiness. Because God made a way where there didn't seem to be a way. Receive the embrace when you come and you meet there. And when you do that, remember God's goodness. Look at verse 5. Lifted up his eyes, the women and the children. Who are these with you? So he said, the children whom God graciously gave your servant. Remember the grace of God. Remember what God has done for you. Remember how God has seen you through everything that you were so worried and troubled about before. Remember how his grace was sufficient and held you up in the things that it didn't seem like he helped you get over. Instead, he helped you get through. By the way, he never promised to take us out of every tr trouble and struggle, did he? But he did promise to be with us in the midst of it. Never promised to turn the fire off in that fiery furnace for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but he was sure in there with them. Never promised to make the rain stop for Noah, but he was there with them. Never promised Adam and Eve that they would never have a problem and never have a trouble. In fact, he gave them a rule knowing that they would break it, but he was in the garden with them. We can tell the stories on and on about how our life has received oftentimes some very difficult days, but we know because of the goodness of God, he's chosen to be there with us. That's who God is. And through the difficult 20 years, of being lied to by now his father-in-law, having the terms of his agreements changed in 20 years over 10 times, the, the wages being taken and given differently than they were promised, and all of the things that were going on in his life, Jacob continued to see the goodness and the grace of God. These are the children that God has graciously given to your servant. This is what God's done for me. Do you have a testimony like that? This is what God's done for me. God was with me in the furnace. God was 
with me in that place that I don't want anybody else to ever have to go. God was with me through the circumstance that I don't want anybody else to ever have to face. God was there with me. And look at what God did as he brought me through, in this case, of a family and children and livestock and servants and all of the things that are mentioned in the previous chapters of our, of our text here in Genesis. Look and see what God has done and remember the grace of God. And by the way, let it be enough. Let it be enough. Uh, as a side note, kind of to where we're, we're here, when we get to verse 6, uh, then the maid servants came near, their children, they bowed down. Verse 7, Leah came near with her children, they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down, all of them giving honor and deference to uh, Brother Esau, who, who was the, the now the, the master of the land. Jacob had been away for 20 years. And uh, in, verse, in, in verse number 8, Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? These ones that he sent ahead with different animals and things as gifts. He said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, Would you look at this? The guy who was angry and mad and, and just, just spitting tacks. I mean, he was angry. He said, I have enough my brother keep what you have for yourself he could have said well I'm glad you sent it because of all that you stole from me 20 years ago before you left he could have said yeah I'm willing to take all that because you deserve to still be poor he could have said let me take all of that from you now because you don't need to have any of that I'm the master of the land now just bring it all into my fold and we'll just work it in and it will be mine and Jacob was ready for that. He was ready to give it to them. He was ready to release all of that so that he could come home and just serve his brother Esau. That's why he called him my Lord. The word there is master. It's not the same word that is used when referring to, to God as the Lord, but, but it's a word that means master. He says, I brought this uh, and sent them to so that I could find favor in the sight of my Lord. And, and Esau said, I have enough. Kind of a side note, but let me just ask you. You got enough? The rich man once was asked, how much money, how much money is going to be enough for, for you to be satisfied? And he said, just, just one more. <laughs> just one more. What's it going to take for you to be satisfied? Well, just, just this and this. Do you have a, a bucket list of things? I'll be satisfied when I get when I get this accolade, when I get this accomplishment, when I get this thing, when I get this number in my bank account, I'll be satisfied when so-and-so is avenged and I have plotted my revenge on them. I'll be satisfied when, you know, perhaps even as harsh and unbelieving and ungodly and unholy and evil as to say I'll be satisfied when they are dead and they rot in hell because of what they've done. What's it going to take for you to say, I have enough? Had enough fighting, fussing. Don't stop that now. Had enough. I have enough food in my cupboard, and, and it's going to come, and God's going to provide. I have enough. I'm going to quit struggling, trying to make a relationship with God become something other than, than a, 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 a relationship of grace, I, I have enough. What's it going to take for you to say, I have enough? To quit striving and struggling for the things of the world and say, I got enough. Let me come and live for you. That's what Jacob said to Esau. And Esau turned it around and said, no, you hang on to your stuff. You just come and live with me. By the way, that's what Jesus is going to say, isn't it? We keep trying to do all of this stuff for him. We keep trying to, I'm going to be better. I'm going to do better. And we struggle so much. I don't read my Bible enough. I'm going to start reading my Bible 82 hours a day. And I don't I don't pray enough. I'm going to start praying the other 82 hours of the day. And, and I don't give enough. I'm going to start giving instead of 10%. I'm going to give 90%. I'm going to live off of 10%. And I'm just struggling. I'm just going to do all this stuff because I'm not sure if God... What, what is enough? How 
much can God do for you to show you that what he's given you is enough? I, I, I love the words to this song. Uh, you might not know it. it. It's by the standards of our singing today, an older song, too, written in 1991 uh, by Larry Bryant and a uh, performance sung by Gary Fitzpatrick, who later became part of the Gator Group and all of that. And listen to these words. Lord, I see so much in me that I just can't get right. Things that weigh me down each day and steal my sleep at night. In your word, I read about a peace I wish I felt. But how can you forgive me when I can't forgive myself? But it was enough, the, the blood that you shed. It was enough that you rose from the dead. It was enough to set me free. It was enough that you died for me. So he turns it around in verse 2. Child, you, you know it hurts me so to see you struggle on, striving to be good enough till all your strength is gone, worn out by fear that you'll go just one sin too far. Don't you know that only I could make you what you are. It was enough. The blood that I shed. It was enough that I rose from the dead. It was enough. Is, is there more I could do? It was enough. And I died for you. How much is enough? How much are you going to try to keep doing? How often are you going to try again to gain favor with God? Instead of trusting that what he's given and what you have because you've trusted in him already is enough. You quit worrying about, does he still love me because I thought about doing this? Does he still love me because I actually tried to do that? Does he still love me because even before I met him, I had this habit that was part of my life? Do I get to go to heaven? I've done so many bad things and all of us have heard somebody say I'm just too bad, God can't love me and I've just satisfied myself with that I want to tell you, the blood of Jesus was enough to cover whoever's sin will bring their sin whoever will bring themselves to him and say, I trust you because I know it's enough and then when he comes and he says you're forgiven that we'll say, I have enough I have enough and at that point, we become satisfied. We become satisfied with Jesus who's done so much to set us free. We become satisfied with the reality that it's not about me being good enough. It's not about me doing enough, but about his care for me in my time. And you don't have to heap a whole bunch more stuff on me. testimony to be able to have. Isn't that a good thing to be able to keep? I have enough. And I'm going to remember that God's goodness becomes enough when I give my heart to Him and when I trust in Him. When we skip on down a little bit, we'll read through it slightly, but um, Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please. If I've now found favor in your sight, remember Years ago, death threats on huh? If I now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from the hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I'd seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing, because God has dealt graciously, graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he saw received it. They went on about what they're going to do, and got busy about their journey. And in verse number 12, Esau said, okay, let's go ahead and take our journey. Let's head home. I'll go on before you and, 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 and just come on. And Jacob knew that even though he had just met with his brother and things were going to be okay, that he still had some responsibilities that he needed to deal with. He, he knew that he still had to take care of his family, his livestock. He knew he still needed to take care of his servants and all of that. And so, when in verse 12, let's go, I'll go before you, and I'll lead the way, let's go. Jacob said, verse 13, uh, my Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and herds are nursing, they're, they're with me. 
And, and if the men should drive the car, even one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. It's kind of like, brother, I remember where the house is. Right? Can, can most of y'all drive back to the house you grew up in? If it's still there, I can drive back to a few houses we lived in. I'm not still there anymore. Um, but um, he, he said, I, I, I know the way home. I'll get there. Verse 14, please let my Lord go on ahead. I will leave on slowly. And here's an important thing for us to grab. Real important. Jacob was the leader of these two bands of wife and children and stock and servants and all of that. And he had been moving at a pace before he met his brother and received the blessing of that forgiveness and that restored relationship that was appropriate for children and for baby livestock who are still nursing and all of that, knowing that if he pushed them too hard, that it would take away all that they had. And so when he reacted to what Esau had to offer, he could have said, well, let's go, and started running. Well, when you did that, you're going to leave somebody behind somebody dead behind. Sometimes we get so busy and let's go, let's do, let's get in a hurry, let's get ahead of what needs to be done, let's go so quickly that we're going to leave somebody behind and possibly leave somebody behind us who is dead or dying because we want to get ahead. And so what did Jacob say? I will leave slowly at a pace which the livestock uh, that, that the livestock can go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord and see. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go slow enough that they can come with me. Boy, don't we sometimes not do that in church? Especially as preachers. We want to get in a great big hurry about everything. Sometimes church members do too. And we can't keep dragging our feet about this and other times Let's keep dragging our feet a little bit more. But Jacob said, I'm going to go slowly enough that even the slowest of my troop can keep up with us. We're not going to leave people behind. There's something in that. There's something in that. Now, there's sometimes some people that's just going to get left behind. That's reality of life. There's sometimes some people that simply refuse to pick up their share and do what they need to do to keep up. That, that's just reality. But oftentimes we move sometimes, often we do, don't we? We move oftentimes so fast, so hurriedly, so hurriedly through the gospel that even a safe person might have a hard time grasping and understanding what we're saying. And, and we move so quickly through uh, trying to make a decision and all of that. And sometimes a decision can't be quick, but sometimes we miss that opportunity to be able to share the gospel. Let me kind of explain it this way a little bit. In the, every off-ramp on the freeway, there was somebody who was designated to get off at that off-ramp and stop at the bottom of that off-ramp and meet whoever is there and give them the good news of Jesus Christ. But that person on the freeway gets to drive in their car just a little bit fast. And they know that at exit 272, whatever that one happens to be, um, on whatever highway they're on, that's their place to get off. And they're in such a hurry to get there that by the time they get there, they've forgotten to move over a lane and move over a lane. They've forgotten to turn on their turn signal. They've forgotten to slow down enough to be able to take the exit. And then what do they do? They come up and they get right almost there and either they bypass the exit because they missed it, right? Or... They say that truck will stop, <laughs> you know, and swing over across five lanes and then cause everybody to have a wreck and whoever's supposed to get to the next exit can't get there because they wrecked them up here. here. Here's the deal. When we get to that thing of worry and God shows us what the solution to that worry thing is going to be, we need to respond to that, that answer in a way that will work with those who are on the journey with us. We may know the answer. We may know what the end looks like. But we need to slow down long enough and say, I'm going to leave slowly enough 
at a pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure. I'll get there. But I'm going to leave slowly enough to get there. See that? You see, here's the deal. Um, and this is especially true for us preachers. That God gives us a vision and God shows us what he, what he wants us to, to point the church into doing. and shows us the steps he wants us and we just want to sit there and boom, 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 boom and, and we want to turn everything all over at once and say, hey, we've got to go slow enough. So everybody can walk with us. And I pray that God helps me to do that. I pray that God helps you to do that in your individual ministries and especially in your home. Sometimes we get way pushy and hurt and I'm grateful for some of the parents even in the day who are willing to take a step back and be slow and say, okay, I want to make sure my son and my daughter really understand the gospel. I want to make sure that they really understand how important they are to the father before we go on to other steps that seem like they might be a little bit more fun or something. I want to I want to be sure that they're going to teach them slowly enough. I'm thankful for the Sunday school teacher that when that silly question gets asked in Sunday school, it is answered so that that child can begin to formulate in their mind what they're trying to figure out about what's going on in the Word of God as they study. See, we need to respond for those who are on the journey with us as best we can. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes there's, there's always an anomaly that we can throw into, but as best we can. He said, and here's why, because rushing can bring loss. And, that, and that's what he said. I'm going to leave slowly enough because I have children who are weak, and I have flocks and herds that are nursing, and, and if we drive them, they'll die. But if we take it easy, we'll have a pace that we can get there because I'm resolved. I'm resolved to, to finish this journey at the end of verse number 14 until I come to my Lord. I'm going to finish the journey. I'm going to finish it at an appropriate pace. I have I have faced my fear, and God has helped it to be better than I ever expected that it could be. And I'm ready to make that thing going because God's goodness is so awesome. And so, guys who are coming with me, let's go together and let's walk. And we won't we won't leave you behind. We might need to pick up curious sometime. We'll do that. We might need to stop so that you can get your nourishment. We'll do that. We might need to wait an extra day here or there so that you can catch your breath and so that you can be strong enough for the next day's journey. We'll do that, but we're going to get there, and in the bottom line, we're going to finish the journey. We need to be resolved that we're going to finish that journey, even if that journey takes us right back where we start. Do you realize that all of this stuff over 20 years that Jacob has been through in the house of Laban and as he left his father's house and headed out to Laban's house and as he turned around and came back, I brought him right back to the beginning place. It's like a baseball game, right? You hit the ball, you go first base. And when you're at first base, you might have trouble because you're taking your lead off and you want to move on. And, and they're watching you and the pitcher might just throw his Throw the ball back over there. If you don't beat, you know, you're going to be out. So a danger at first base. Second base is a tiny bit safer because the pitcher has his back to you. And he's watching the catcher to see what pitch to throw. He's watching the batter to see what stance he's taking. Third base is even worse because the only place you have to go is where the pitcher's ready to throw the ball anyway. But eventually, you head home. Get right back where you started from. And when you do, you score the point, right? Well, I'm resolved that I'm going to get a run. I'm resolved, even if it takes me right back to the place where I began, and it does, because it takes you right back into a perfect relationship with God where you don't have any sins that are going to get in the way of you having to spend eternity with Him because He's going to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all your unrighteousness just as if you were a brand new baby, just born, and, and, and you have yet to have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Listen, you're going to get right back to that cleanness, that wholeness, that fullness when you come to Jesus. And He who began that good work in you, calling you to repentance and shedding His blood so that your price could be paid, will forgive you and will clean you and will bring you back home. 
result and finish the journey? See, we have a lot of people that don't really know what the journey is. Jacob knew where he's going. He's gone home. Jacob knew what the prize was. It's to be a family again at home and to be there and, 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 and to be a part of what his dad had built up and what God had given them. Jacob knew where it was. He had been there before. He journeyed from there. Now he's journeying to there. And so he says, Esau, it's okay. You go on home. You get to your place. You get in your comfort. And, and I'll see you when I get there. But I'm going to finish. I'm not going to let somebody that's having a bad day at church make me not come to church anymore. You know what I mean? You ever been to your favorite restaurant and got bad service? Do you go back? Right? You ever been to Walmart and they checked you out and just got it wrong? Do you go back? You ever have a bad day at school? Kid beat you up, picked on you. Teacher wasn't what you wanted the teacher to be. Did you go back? You ever have a day at work when you just couldn't accomplish anything? And, and your pencil kept breaking and the pencil sharpener wouldn't work and your computer, your, your computer just came unplugged right in the middle of an important document. And then, uh, did you go back? Well, listen, when you come to church and you have a bad day, come on back. Resolve to finish. Don't give up on the church because somebody's having a bad day. Don't give up on the Lord because somebody's having trouble. Don't give up on what God started in your life because you're having a difficulty facing a particular hurdle. But get up and face that hurdle that's eventually going to come into full view. Receive the embrace of that hurdle, even if it's a painful embrace. And when you receive that embrace, remember how good God is. He'll see you through whatever you need to see through in the way that He knows is best. For you, for his word says he's working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Remember to respond in a way that remembers those who are with you and finish the journey. Finish the journey. <coughs> Don't stop in the middle of it. Don't let some of us old Baptists give you an excuse to quit. Don't let somebody's temper take you out of what God's doing in your life. Don't let somebody who's, who's, who might just be having an issue in their life that's worse than the issue you're having in yours draw your attention away from the love of God which will see you through. Finish the job. How do you do that? Well, you be like the Apostle Paul. You just keep running the race. Not, not that I've already attained, he said, not but I can run with endurance. Not that I've already arrived at the goal, but I'm, I'm just going to keep on running. I know that, that in the race, there's only one that wins the prize. Well, this is my race. And I'm going to finish this race. In fact, I'm going to finish this race even if I don't get the prize because I know that the high calling of God in Christ Jesus is going to give me an eternal home in heaven and I'm going to keep on going just like I'm already there because I know with assurance inside of me, he's not going to take it from me. No matter what I've done, no matter who I am, I'm going to finish. I'm going to finish raising my kids. That happens for you. Now what? You're 45? Is that about when you kick them out of the basement and say, what are you doing? I'm going to finish paying my debt. However that payment looks. I'm going to finish my education. I'm going to finish my task at school. I'm going to finish my work. When it's all done, they're going to say about me, he might not have done much, but what he did do, he finished. And it's complete. And he knew that his Lord finished his place that he was preparing for him. You see, not only are we called to finish, but our Lord has promised that he Close your eyes. No one's looking around. Each one is looking within. Maybe God's speaking to you today. Is God speaking to you that you need to finish responding to the gospel? You've heard it so many times that God will forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from unrighteousness. That if you'll just simply ask Him, He will repair the relationship that you broke by breaking His <coughs>
sharing the gospel that you've started with somebody. <coughs> Maybe you need to finish walking with the Lord in a particular avenue of your life and the job that He's given you to do. He'll walk with you. He'll make sure you know the way. What do you need to finish today? What prayer? We'll stand. We're going to sing, and maybe God's going to say to you, as we begin singing, that you need to come to the front of the auditorium and just pray about something. Nobody will bother you unless you indicate that you want somebody to pray with you, then we'll pray with you. Maybe today you need to walk from the place where you'll be standing and receive the grace of God and say, I know your grace is enough. And I'm going to say it, that it's enough for me. And I'll receive it today. How's God calling you to respond? Would you do what he says to do today? Father, we, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the accounts of real people that we can read. Help us remember how good you are. Give us strength, Father, to finish what you've called us to.